Studio A for Amen. Now, where's my... I don't want that doing that. I want that. Okay, here we go. I have to, this is my, this is my logo. I, I, this is my outfit when I do this. We're not live yet, but I'm late actually. I told them I'd be here at uh, 11.15. Three, two. Okay, I think we've got everything. Boy, there's so many moving parts. Where's our clicker? Thank you. All right. We are live on TikTok. Make sure this thing's lined up just right. So this is going out to the planet, boys and girls. Okay, the real nativity story. I'm going to try to uh, put a lot of material in a short amount of time. Uh, this will require seat belts fastened, thinking caps on, and I want to make sure I think I've got my echo on. Uh, Alex, can you take the echo off all the way on the mains? Real nativity story, boom. And happy St. Patty's Day Thank for all you. the Irish. I am Irish. Thank you very much. Kenny in Ireland is like Smith in America. Follow, tap the screen, share the live. I'm going to say that several times. Uh, if you know how TikTok works, people will start coming in. Um, I've got about 3,200 followers on, on TikTok. That's, that's small change compared to some of the people. They've got uh, 100 million followers. Um, so I'll be saying that every now and then. For those on TikTok, I'm going to be speaking to you on the, on the pad. I'm going to be recording to a camera, which is this entire presentation will go up on YouTube later on. Let's ask the question, is new truth being revealed at this time? Yes. Are you sure? Yeah. All right. <laughs> there are those that would disagree. It's all been done. The Christian world will tell you that it's all been done. There's nothing left to be revealed. But I'll tell you what, we're going to talk about Jesus. In the 16th chapter of John, he says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears, he will speak and show you the things that are to come. Jesus is promising 2,000 years ago that more was coming. There's no way around this. And Jesus, being a man of his word... He's predicting something in the future. In the same chapter, 25th verse, these things I've spoken to you in Proverbs, but the time comes when I shall no more speak to you in Proverbs, but I will show you plainly of the Father. Hmm. Plainly. Jesus said plainly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, the mysteries are over. At a certain point in history, Jesus says, I will tell you plainly of the Father. Every now and then if someone comes in, all right, now, there's only six people right now as they come in and they ask a good question. Um, I might respond to it live. We'll, we'll see. So Adam and Eve were in the ideal according to Scripture. We're going to be dealing with the scriptural story of the fall and the life of Jesus. But we have to establish something that, that truth is being revealed. Something new is coming. And it's very easy to show this from a historical chart. Adam and Eve in the Bible were in the ideal. They had a fall. 2,000 years from the fall, Moses comes with the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Rails to run on. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. Don't do this, do that, boom. Because out of this chaos, imagine after the fall, how screwy the world is. In Genesis 6, 6, God says, I repent that I have made man. The flood of Noah comes, wipes everything out. God starts all over again. 2,000 years from Moses to Jesus, Jesus comes to the New Testament Gospels and says, I am the fulfillment of the law. God is actually not canceling the Old Testament, but God is trying to bring the Old Testament Jews and the Israelites out of that into something brand new. Jesus said, I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The first five are vertical between man and God. The second five are between people. Jesus comes. Jesus is for all practical purposes, and you can't say the K word on TikTok. I will say unalived. The word is unalived. I will say it assassinated. <laughs> and he says, I got to come back, which brings us to the second coming and the completed testament age. Remember, Jesus said, I will reveal everything. Yeah. There's coming a time in the future when, when I'm going to reveal everything. Interestingly enough, every 2,000 years, God reveals something brand new. Every 2,000 years, like clockwork. What year are we in? 2024. 2024. We're, two, we're 24 years past this point. We should not be surprised that God is opening up a brand new phase of his providence right now. That means our antennas have to be up, our seatbelts have to be fastened, our hearts and minds have to be open. And I have to
to grab my orange juice. And tasty it is. So, God has been driving, God is the driving force behind history, bringing back the ideal. Series, history is not just a series of random disconnected events, but if you take the word history and divide it into two words, you get what? It doesn't prove anything, no. Interesting to note, his story. History is the story of God's action through time. Through time. So, this, interestingly enough, Easter season, right? Well, this is called the creche scene, historically. Baby Jesus in the barn, the animals, etc., etc. And uh, it's been depicted in any number of different ways. From the sublime, Reuben, oh, the angels and this and that, to the absolute ridiculous and everything in between. Right? But we have to ask ourselves a question. What's wrong with this picture? We look at this too adoring, like, oh, look at the baby. Look, at there's a sheep right there. How cute, how wonderful. Do you understand what this is? This is a barn. And, and, and this is a manger. What's wrong with this picture? Well, there's a camel. There's a cow. There's three sheep, a donkey, and Jesus is in the middle of it all. What's a manger in the Bible? See, we have, to, we have to pull the story apart piece by piece to really understand it in depth. When the child Jesus was born, his mother Mary laid him in a manger, Luke 2.7. The word manger comes from the Latin word manducare, which means to eat. A manger or crib is a wooden or stone feeding trough or food box that holds hay for larger farm animals like cattle, horses, and donkeys. So in that manger is more than likely animal saliva, un... un chewed food parts, etc. It's filthy. It's absolutely disgusting place to lay a child. We're going to go on about that a little bit in the, in the future here. So, we have to ask ourselves the question, how is it that Jesus could have been born in this situation? It's easy to say, well, that was just the will of God. But there had to be a process. There had to be a process for him to end up like that. And to understand that, we have to go back to beginnings. Some of these slides I'm going to compress. I'm going to just tell you what the content of the slide is because there's a lot of text, all right? Every 2,000 you drop for most of it. <laughs> Stick with me, user 568. Stick with me, my friend. I'll tell you why, why Gramps is teaching fairy tales. That's the kind of comments you get. <laughs> I love it. I thrive on that stuff. Malachi says in 4 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Important point here is God is promising that Elijah the prophet is going to come. He's been dead for 800 years when this comes around. Last chapter of the last book in the Old Testament. I will send you Elijah the prophet. This is extremely important. Keep this in mind. Now, in Luke chapter 1, this essentially says Zechariah is the high priest in Judea. Him and his wife Elizabeth are well stricken in years, it says. Well stricken in years, in other words, they can't have a child. Very difficult, almost impossible for Elizabeth to have a child at this point. He's supposed to burn incense in the temple. There's a whole multitude of people praying outside the time of incense. This is important. This seems like nothing. It's just telling you there's a bunch of people outside the temple. But this is critically important to the story. There appeared in him an angel of the Lord, the angel, and Zechariah saw him. He was troubled, and fear fell upon him. The angel said, Fear not, for your prayer is heard. Your wife Elizabeth shall bear you a son, and you call his name John. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and this is where you have to pay attention. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb, and go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children uh, and the disobedient of the wisdom to the just to make ready people prepare for the Lord. Remember, Malachi chapter 4, I will send you Elijah the prophet. The angel Gabriel is saying to Zechariah, your son is going to go forward in the spirit and power of Elias. Elias and Elijah are interchangeable in the Old Te and New Testament. It's like John and Johnny, Bobby and Robert, right? Elias, it's, it, they're interchangeable. So the angel is telling Zechariah, your son is going to be Elijah. He's going to fulfill that. What does Jesus say about John the Baptist. In Matthew 17, and disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? This tells us two very important things. The disciples of Jesus are asking Jesus, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must first come? That tells you, number one, 
The disciples of Jesus knew nothing about scripture. They were tax collectors, fishermen, prostitutes, alcoholics. The leadership didn't want to deal with him. So he had to go by the byways and highways, as they say, and get people, anybody he could, to listen to him. And two, the scribes are sending people behind Jesus' back and trying to pull his disciples. Look, how can your boss be the Messiah? Where's Elijah? Where? There's no Elijah. See, these little things, we've glossed them over for 2,000 years. I tell you, there's new revelation on the earth right now. Got that, TikTokers? All right. And Jesus answered said to them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatever they desired. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. By Matthew 17, John the Baptist is already dead. He's in prison by Matthew 11. He's already dead. And Jesus is saying, he's come already. They knew him not, and they've done unto him whatever they desired. They, he's already been beheaded. And Jesus says, likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. He knows without John the Baptist, there's no way for Jesus to stay alive. This is, an, this is again, this is an unusual concept, but this is true, and we're going to bear it out here as we go along. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. He's clearly equating John the Baptist with the fulfillment of Elijah. There's no way to possibly misunderstand this. What? That's right, I said it. Follow, tap the screen, share the live. Tell everybody, t tell you what, TikTokers, get your list out. Talk to people. You're going to miss this. Boom. Why would this be significant? Since the fourth century, Jews have put out a cup of Elijah. Interestingly enough, every Seder feast, the seat of Elijah, which where Elijah presides over circumcisions and, and the ritualistic sacrifices within the Judaic tradition, they want Elijah should be preceding and, and presiding over these uh, festivities and a place for Elijah. There's always an empty seat, a plate, a cup, and they leave the door open just in case Elijah comes. What an amazing tradition to keep that tradition for so long and not have it fulfilled. Back to our story. Now, remember Zechariah's in the temple. He's had his revelation. Luke 1.18. Zechariah said to the angel, Zechariah is now responding to the angel. Whereby shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife well stricken in years. The angel just told him, your wife's going to have a baby. He's going, no, come on. You've got to be kidding. My wife's 150 years old, whatever it was. Doesn't say really, but <laughs> she's too old to have a child. This is going to be miraculous. I'll show you these glad tidings. Behold, you shall be dumb and not be able to speak until the day these things will be performed. So the archangel Gabriel takes his ability to speak. He says, you will be dumb. Until, this, until your wife has that child, you're not going to be able to talk. And the people waited. Remember, we talked about the multitude outside. This is very important. A lot of people are witnessing this and marvel that he tarried so long in the temple. They're like milling around like, well, this is like he goes in, burns in, says, should we be out already? And when he came out, he could not speak. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. Somehow they knew something happened in that temple. And he beckoned to them and remained speechless. He just had his voice taken away. And he's just seen the angel of the Lord. It came to pass that as soon as the days of misery, he goes back to his house. Essentially, he goes back to his house. Everybody tracking so far? Yes. All right. Got oh, he just went back to his house. After this, after this responsibility to burn incense in the temple, he just returned back to his house. Now, the narrative continues with Gabriel. Now appearing to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Same chapter going down the list. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Hail that you are high favorite. Essentially tells her, you are going to give birth to the Messiah, essentially. Uh, his name will be called Jesus. Now, uh, another important point, to a virgin espoused to a man named Joseph. That's engaged. That's not married. That's engaged. All right? It continues. Mary said to the angel, how shall this be, seeing as I know not a man? To know a man, to have knowledge of a man in Old Testament parlance, is to have a sexual relationship. She's not had a sexual relationship with anybody. The angel angel said, the Holy Ghost will come upon you. Basically, the angel says, don't worry. The Holy Ghost will come upon you. And that holy thing will, you, will be called the Son of God. 
and your cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived uh, a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, uh, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. In the very next verse, boom. Mary gets this revelation from the angel Gabriel, and she arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste, quickly. She gets the revelation and immediately does something about it. Into a city of Judah and enters into the house of Zechariah and saluted Elizabeth. Very important. Well, you would think, it makes it sound like she walked across the street and knocked on the door. But no, no. This is where she gets the revelation. She's got to go here. That is, uh-oh, 60 miles. What? Yeah. Nobody's really examined this. This is like, <laughs> she's like, hey, Zach, I'm here. No. There's no evidence she went with anybody either. Wow. This is a, historians put her between 14 and 16 years old. Very young girl. It continues. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, Mary's now coming to the house. The babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spoke out with a loud voice, Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So Elizabeth somehow knows of this revelation. Clearly, she somehow received the fact that her cousin, Mary, is going to give birth to the Messiah. And whence is it that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Blah, blah, blah. Luke 1, 45 to 55 is called the Magnificat. In the Catholic Church, there's 10 verses there. Glory is the, the Lord of David. And they go on and on extolling the virtues of what's happening right there. So this essentially is Mary coming to Zechariah's house, greeting Elizabeth, who is, remember, already six months pregnant. The babe leapt in my womb. This is Elizabeth. Mary is not pregnant. Luke 1, 56. And Mary abode with her about three months. Scripture says she abode there three months and then returned to her own house. What? <laughs> All the way back, you might say. Well, of course, Mary went to Elizabeth's house to help her with the birth. After all, they were cousins, according to Luke 136. However, seat belts fastened, thinking caps on. Luke 1, 57, the very next verse. And Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth the son. Mary is out of the house. She didn't go there to help with that birth. Because it says she stayed there three months and left. And then, chronologically, then Elizabeth has a baby after Mary's gone from the house. Small point, remember it. Chronological... Why does Mary leave Elizabeth's house perhaps days before the birth of Elizabeth's son? There is no further record of any cooperation between these two families henceforth, save for Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist in Matthew 3.16. There's nothing in it. The families do nothing with each other. There's no, there's no, Zechariah gets a revelation. Elizabeth gets a revelation. Joseph gets a revelation. Mary gets a revelation. You would think they would be sticking together like glue. My gosh, we they, they should be three feet off the ground. There's no evidence that this is happening at all. Okay. Is it at all possible? Seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on. Get comfy. Is it at all possible that Elizabeth might have perhaps lost her faith and suspected that something illicit might have happened between Mary and Zechariah? Remember, these people, when they're painted and depicted, they always have like a ring around their head and they're like a couple inches off the ground. No, they were just like us and, and probably a little more funky than us, <laughs> right? Follow, tap the screen, share the live. All right, Matthew 1, 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ is on this watch. Now you gotta remember, <sighs> Jerusalem, Nazareth, Bethlehem, all those cities, they're bustling metropolis, metropoli now, but back then they were tiny little birds with five, six, seven, ten thousand. Word travels fast. Mary goes to the high priest's house, stays there three months, and by all practical understanding, comes out pregnant. This Holy Spirit thing has happened somehow at that time period. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was the spouse of Joseph, espoused to Joseph, before they, came to, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, being a husband, 
uh, her husband being a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily. It's clear she's showing pregnancy. He's embarrassed. It's like, oh my God, we're not married. It, this is more proof that they were not married. He's saying, I gotta hide her. This is unusual, this is weird, right? But while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is the Holy Ghost. So the angel pushes him. You've got to, to take her as your wife right now. You've got to publicly unite with her. People have to understand it's your child. Otherwise, she's going to get stoned to death. Yeah. Why didn't they stone Mary? She's already showing pregnancy. Why didn't they stone her? That's by the Mosaic law. She should have been stoned to death. She doesn't have a husband because she's the cousin of the wife of the high priest of Judah. They're giving her a little bit of breathing room here. Well, she is related to the, etc. Let's get back to our lost revelation, okay? Boy, that's impossible. Zechariah had an enormous revelation. Mary had a gargantuan revelation. Joseph was visited by an angel, and Elizabeth clearly knew of Zechariah's and Mary's revelations. <laughs> but it wouldn't be the first time that huge revelations were so quickly forgotten under stressful situations. Now would it? Even John the Baptist doubted his own mission and the mission of Jesus. What? That's right. How do we prove that? Yeah, we can. Matthew 3.16, Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. John the Baptist probably gets the biggest revelation in human history. God is making it very, very clear. This is my, do you read over earth calling Venus, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Amazing. Only eight chapters later in Matthew 11, the following transpires, seat belts fastened. Oh my goodness, what's he doing over here? Now when John had heard in the prison, <laughs> the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Are you he that should come, or do we look for another? Wait a minute. Eight chapters ago, he's getting a revelation in the River Jordan directly from God. The dove comes down, the clouds part, ugh, the voice of God. Eight chapters later, he's in here. Very, very interesting. Or do we look for another? He's sending disciples out. Man, I'm, what am I doing here? Who are you? Who am I? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Here it comes. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Clearly Jesus is saying to John, you're offended in me, John. You're offended in me. It continues. Uh-oh. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Malachi 4, 5. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, this is Jesus speaking to those disciples that John has sent, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. In other words, greatest born of women. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus is saying, no matter what, the guy who's hanging on to the kingdom of heaven by his fingernails is greater than John the Baptist. What does that tell you? John the Baptist is not in the kingdom of heaven. He's already dead. He's already dead. And the, now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Jesus clearly says this is Elijah that you guys have been waiting for for hundreds of years. 400 years. Malachi came 400 years before Christ. Matthew 17. Again, reiterating, why then the scribes say Elias must first come? Elias has come already. Matthew 17, and the disciples understood that he spoke to him, John the Baptist. John the Baptist is Elijah. It's all important. Without John the Baptist, without Elijah, the Jews cannot believe in Jesus. There's no way. That's why the scribes are saying to them, where's Elijah? If your boss is the Messiah, where's Elijah? Here's why he didn't know he was Elijah. John 1, 19. 
And this is the record of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? They sent the Levitical group. These are the guys that are going to adjudicate the law. Somebody has to die. Oop, somebody has to be unalived. Sorry. So they're sending people to John, and they, and they asked him, Who are you? First they asked him, Who are you? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. For him to answer like that, they must have asked him, Are you the Messiah? Luke 3.15 says that all people wondered in their hearts whether he was a Christ or not. The people in, in Israel were wondering if John the Baptist was the Messiah or not. That's the, the view of John the Baptist in the eyes of Israel at the time. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elias? He said, I am not. They asked him again. Look, we <laughs> somebody's going away today. And we're going to ask you one more time. <laughs> it's amazing how they asked him twice. They want to make sure we're really clear because we got to go back and tell these people. I am not. Are you that? They, I can imagine they probably like, are you that prophet? They probably yelled a little bit. Are you that prophet? <laughs> he answered, no. What did Jesus just get done saying? He is. That he is Elijah. He flatly denies the mission when pressed on the question. What? right. John is clearly at this point confused as to who he is and who Jesus is. And remember, again, these people are, are depicted three inches off the ground with halos. They're not. They have fears. They have prejudices. They have doubts and problems, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <laughs> That's really a problem with Renaissance art. <laughs> we have this, this image of these people that they didn't do any wrong. They were perfect in every way. They weren't. They weren't. How in the world did John end up in prison in the first place? That's the next question. What's he doing in prison? How did he get there? Through a very clear, definitive process. To understand this, we have to understand the following story. And we'll take a slight detour to illustrate this very important point. We're going to go off track a little bit, but we're going to come back. John 8. This is very interesting. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came. I'm going to read this all because this is so important. There's so much here. He sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what say you? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. Can we turn that on like a little bit? Fan. Very interesting. So what's happening is they've caught a woman in adultery. They're going to test Jesus. Let's, let's, let's check this guy out. See if he's on board with this or not. But Jesus stooped down. Seat belts fastened, thinking caps on. Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. He just disregarded everything they were saying. So when they continued to ask him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin amongst you, let him... Uh, first cast a stone at her. What could he have been writing? Nobody knows what he wrote in the sand. I know what he wrote in the sand. The, reason, the only reason why he would say something like that is he, in the sand, he had to have been writing the names of women that those guys were involved with. Do you think as a son of God he did not know what they were up to? Adultery was widespread and very common in the Jewish community at this time. He's writing the name of women. Remember, he didn't accuse anybody. He just wrote. And then he st stood up and he says, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Check it out. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one. The only thing that would have possibly made someone drop a stone at a stoning was the, their own conscience. Oh my gosh, he knows who I've been involved with. Oh my goodness. So they just quietly dropped the rock and and book it, right? E beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself, he saw none but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are those your accusers? Has no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How terribly interesting. What could he have been writing in the sand? The only thing could have been the names of women, that all those people that are fully ready to kill this woman caught in adultery, they were already involved in the same activity. 
Boom. Convicted by their own conscience. It's the only thing he could have possibly been writing in the sand. Word of this incident must have gotten back to John. And in the ancient Judaic tradition, this is impossible for John's disciples to accept. Can you imagine John's disciples seeing this and going, Oh my God, I can't believe this guy. <laughs> they run back to John. John, do you know what we just saw? You, your boss forgave a woman caught in adultery. Come on. How, how long are we going to put up with this? Clearly violates the Levitical law that a woman caught in adultery should be stoned to death. What does John do? Mm. John is now in the unenviable position to have to make a decision that unbeknownst to him will determine his destiny, the destiny of Jesus, Israel, and the world for the next 2,000 years. Matthew 14, 1 and 12. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for you to have her. He's accusing Herod of adultery with his brother's wife. Jesus is forgiving adultery across the town. John should have been there going, Yep, that's exactly what should be happening. <laughs> Endorsing Jesus' activity. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Herod's in a real sticky wicket now because there's a whole bunch of followers of John. But at the same time, his daughter, has, he's promised his daughter whatever she wants. But when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias, Salome, danced before them and pleased Herod, whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. There's another scripture that says, up to half of his kingdom. Wow. And she being before instructed of her mother, the mother says, give me here the Baptist head on a charger. This is not the daughter's desire. It's the mother pushing the daughter to execute John the Baptist. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, for the oath's sake and, which, and they which sat with him at dinner, he commanded it to be given her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison, and his head was brought in a charger and given to his daughter, brought it to her mother, and his disciples came, took up the body and buried it, and went and told Jesus. Now, we can see just how an enormous revelation can be quickly forgotten under pressure. So we shouldn't be surprised that everybody lost their revelations. It happens under pressure. Back to Elizabeth. We're coming, now we're coming back on the story. So, now the birth of John the Baptist. Her neighbors and her cousins, let me do this. And her neighbors and cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her and they rejoiced with her. And it came to pass that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child. John the Baptist has now been born. They called him Zacharias after the name of his father. That was the Jewish tradition. You name the firstborn son after the father. But the mother answered and said, No, he shall be called John, because the angel told him, You'll name him John. And they said to her, But there's none of your kindred that is called by this name. They made signs to the father. Remember, he can't speak. The angel said, You're not going to be able to speak until these things are done how he should have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet. There was a, back then they would use a wax tablet. If they couldn't talk, they'd have a wax tablet and a stylus. And, and he wrote saying, his name is John. And they marveled all. And his mouth was opened immediately and his tongue loosed and he pr spoke and praised God. Fear came on all that dwelt round about them. And these sayings were noised abroad throughout the hill country of Judea. This is huge for the people of Israel. Huge. A miracle has just happened. They've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for Elijah for a long time. And all they that heard them laid them up at the heart, saying, What manner of child shall this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. Interesting. See how this is all kind of coming together? Later on in the book of Luke, in a mere two chapters, it jumps from John the Baptist's birth to his ministry at 30 years old. And as the people were in expectation, all men mused in their hearts of John whether he were the Christ or not. Remember, we're talking about the birth of Christ. How did Jesus end up in a barn? How did Jesus end up in a barn? Remember, Matthew 17, Jesus has equated John the Baptist with the promised Elijah. Well, what's that got to do with this? We're getting there. We're getting there. Patience, my children. Yeah, Luke 2. And it came to pass in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was the governor of Syria. 
and all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house of the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So they've got to do this again. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Big, long 60-mile trip. Matthew 1, 18. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. So remember, everybody knows, this is a small town, everybody knows that she spent three months in the house of Zechariah the, the high priest. And she comes out pregnant. <laughs> However the Holy Spirit worked, the Holy Spirit worked right there. Angel of the Lord appeared to him in dreams, saying, Joseph, son of David, take Mary as your wife. Otherwise, she's, again, she's going to get stoned to death. Oh, uh, and she brought forth her firstborn son, born son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. No room for them in the inn. A pregnant woman whose water has more than likely already broken. They're, they're in an emergency situation and they can't make room, like make a corner or like borrow someone's room. Hey, mine, can, this lady's going to have a baby. Can we just use your room just for a couple of minutes? Nothing like that. It could be. We don't know this. The Bible doesn't say this. But it could be the innkeeper had that barn that Jesus was born into. Anyone in the right mind would have made room somewhere in the inn. Why in the world would Mary not have her baby at her cousin Elizabeth's house? They're this close. They could have planned this long in advance. Remember, there's no cooperation between these two families ever again. After Mary's in that house, there's an estrangement that happens in that house that is never repaired never repaired and eventually John the Baptist goes off accuses Herod of adultery gets himself assassinated <laughs> unalived <laughs> the babe leaped someone says on could it be that a scandal was created at the time of Mary's visit to Zechariah's house and rumors persisted in the area until Joseph and Mary's arrival at the census in Bethlehem could it be remember small tiny little towns Matthew 13 This is a really interesting verse. Um, is this not the carpenter's son? Is, and is not his mother called Mary? And his brother, people are like, who is this guy? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, quite a big family here. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then has this man all these things? They were offended. His own family was offended in him. He was always considered illegitimate. Even historians say the same thing considered illegitimate. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor save in his own country and in his own house. For neither did his brethren believe in him. No one believed in him except a small handful of people. I can't make this stuff up. What's the relative image of Jesus and John the Baptist? Well, here we go. Let's line them up. Let's see what the Jewish people are seeing at the time. Son of the high priest Zechariah. Who? Son of a carpenter. Hmm. John the Baptist, miraculous birth of Luke 1. Father is struck dumb. As soon as he's born and he names him, the father begins to speak. Jesus was assumed illegitimate. Luke 2, 5. Mary is great with child being espoused, not married. The angel has to come to Joseph and force him to take her, make sure people know it's you. Otherwise, she's going to die. Schooled by the religious elite, you can bet John the Baptist from his birth was raised in the temple with all the, 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 the teachers of the law, making sure we don't know who this guy is. Could be the Messiah, could be Elijah, we're not sure, but we're going to make sure he's educated. Boom. Apparently on school, there's no evidence that Jesus had any kind of formal training, yet he knew the scriptures better than many of the, the elite. He studied on his own. Ascetic ate locusts and honey in the desert. Right? They thought he was Christ. See, we're doing relative image of Jesus and John the Baptist. Jesus forgives adultery in John 8. Leviticus demands death for adultery. John the Baptist accuses Herod of adultery. <laughs> Big mistake. Taught hate of parents. Luke 14, 26. The Jews are saying, he's teaching us to hate our mother and father <laughs> in violation of the, of the commandments. He ate with sinners, Matthew 9. What good thing can come from Nazareth, people are asking themselves. Good grief. What is this guy's Messiah nonsense? It's Nazareth. <laughs> Fulfillment. He said, I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. In the eyes of Israel, if we make claims like that, you're dead man walking if, if a second party is not testifying. If there's no John the Baptist there, when Jesus says these things, in fact, in John 8, 
they say you testify to yourself therefore your testimony is not true in the mouth of two more witnesses every word shall be established and then Jesus finally this is the straw that breaks the camel's back in Matthew 9 he says that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sin rise up take your bed and walk your sins are forgiven it goes on to say who can forgive sins but God alone it's like the Jewish people are just going nuts like we can't deal with this this is crazy John simply through the force of his reputation and authority could have led everyone to Jesus and thus to the world in short order what does that look like and we're winding down now a couple more slides and we're done this is an encapsulation and a distillation of an enormous lecture that takes actually four hours to do I'm, I'm extracting something uh, bits and pieces of the mission of the Messiah lecture and essentially uh, dealing specifically with the birth of Jesus and John the Baptist what does that look like here's Jesus here's John the Baptist what should have happened 2,000 years ago well John the Baptist has 120 disciples that are watching his every move they're thinking yeah <laughs> the nation of Israel is hovering over him like oh my gosh they're just wait say the word say the word are you the Christ yes or no we're ready <laughs> Israel is occupied by Rome. All roads lead to Rome. What could have happened? Jesus and John the Baptist advance to the Israel level, to the Roman level. Imagine Israel is occupied by Rome. What if Herod takes Jesus and John the Baptist, sends them under Praetorian guard to Rome, introduces them to Tiberius Caesar? They bring Caesar, or John the Baptist and Jesus to the Colosseum. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Not for me, but I want to introduce my friend from Israel here. You guys give him the honor you give me now. They always thought the emperor was God, right? So he transfers that to Jesus. Jesus addresses the entire Roman Empire. The Roman Empire takes Jesus' message to the entire planet in a matter of six months. All roads lead to Rome. Boom! right there was a man sent from God whose name was John the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe what that all men through who through John the Baptist there was a man sent from God whose name was John the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light who's the light Jesus, Jesus. Hmm. that all men through so clearly the Bible is saying that John's mission was that through him everyone would believe in Jesus. This did not happen. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, the clincher. But we speak the wisdom of God and the mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, seat belts fastened, thinking caps on, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I can't make this stuff up. I can't make this stuff up. First, if they would have known the hidden wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. What was the hidden wisdom? Not to crucify the Lord of glory. Hello. But what happened? So, boom. Jesus and John the Baptist are unalived. The disciples. Israel is wiped out by Titus and the Roman legions in 70 AD. The Roman Empire is overcome by the Visigoths in the 4th century. And the Dark Ages for a thousand years. Everything, the whole planet was, was on the ascendancy. And everything went right down like a roller coaster after the death of Jesus Christ. Remember, we are in a brand new age. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, we're in a brand new age. God is revealing what did Jesus say I will tell you plainly of the father no more parables if this isn't plainly of the father I don't know what is I don't know what is so that story looks a little bit different now doesn't it now we know exactly how Jesus ended up like this very very clear those on TikTok you can see this presentation tonight on YouTube. All right. Thank you very much for being with me. And uh, I'll say goodbye to the YouTuber or the uh, TikTokers right now. Thank you very much for being with me. Amen. That's it. Thank you.
John Kenny. Thank mm -hmm. you. He's still live. Yep. Thank you very much. That's a great presentation. And again, if you want to say you love somebody, you have to know them and understand them. That's right. real, true love. 